Uh, so I'm Alex Porter. I am the CEO of Montech Labs, and we wanted to give this talk today about, uh, you know, 3D scanning and sort of giving you just an overview of what the applications are, what types of, uh, you know, scanning and uh, video and photo capabilities are out there to capture realistic content. We think that uh, the capture part of content creation is actually um, very widely open for folks to access. And we want to give we want to give away the keys to the kingdom on that side because we think that uh, there are far greater professionals out there than we can ever compete with in regard to capture. They're much much uh, more high end, you know, photographers, um, videographers, etc., that can access this tech. Exactly. So I do what I said exactly exactly yeah. So um, this is our second start well third startup. Um, so we had a previous startup um, that that this actually spun out of um, Underminer Studios in a very early iteration of this tech uh, called Volumation in which we, uh, you know, we've really been working on this for three years. We were working in the B2B XR space and the, the goal with this tool set that we started creating was to make realistic content more accessible. Um, and ultimately, uh, what came out of that was this wonderful platform that we've created um, that is much more open and, and broadly uh, applicable than what we had um, previously. Uh, in the last four years, we've worked across entertainment, we've worked across media, um, medical, uh, you name it. And our focus has always been sort of back in tools creation. We want to enable other people to do their creative work and, and execute their a vision uh, more easily with tools that are uh, more affordable um, that work more effectively and that just make their teams that much better. We're a venture back startup um, based in Austin, Texas. And for the last three years, we've actually been recognized by Intel as uh, top innovators, uh, both Tim and myself. Uh, and we are really enjoying, you know, working sort of in a multitude of ways with these, with these large corporations, but we're really, we're really angling um, a lot of our tech and a lot of how we're working with folks these days to those smaller studios, because we think that they're the ones that uh, really have the most uh, opportunity to implement this and really change, you know, not only their, their bottom line, but their team dynamics and how they build their company and, and how we can scale content creation across the entire you know, market space. Um, last year, we were also uh, awarded a City of Austin Innovation Award. And Tim is going to introduce himself. I am. I'm Tim Porter. I am CTO and founder of Montec Labs. I spent almost 20 years in the game and movie industry. Uh, inside of video games, I was a technical artist in movies. I was a pipeline technical director. Um, last movie I actually worked on was Alice in Wonderland through the Looking Glass. It was a lot of fun. Um, we worked at different places like Two Bit Circus and um, game loft, uh, real networks, things like that. Um, so, you know, give you a little bit about myself. Um, I really like the concept of automation. I, I understand and I pick up technology very quickly. Um, but because of my position as, as being a technical artist, uh, I spent a lot of time with people, uh, that just didn't necessarily have the same technological uptake uh, and ability to access that technology, you know, even within our uh, environment, uh, there are a lot of companies that just cannot find technical people fast enough. And so when we decided to create this, it was it was an equalizer. Like, how do we get to mid tier and small studios and go, hey, here's some new technology, here's automated tools. Um, and how do we accelerate that? And then, of course, for large studios, how do we keep up that quality look uh, and 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 make this new environment, which is real time production, which is uh, scanning heavy movies? How do we make it to where we can continue doing that? So, on one end, we're trying to make VFX much more magical, and then, of course, on the other end, we're trying to give accessibility. You know, the Mandalorian in your backyard. It's it's definitely a possibility uh, with what we're trying to do. So, uh, yeah, that's me. So we're going to just give a brief overview of each of the types of capture as we go through. We're going to do some use cases for, for each. And, and really, we just want to give you know, sort of that topical understanding of, of where these are all applicable um, in, in the best use cases and, and how these can be accessed. Um, much of our uh, you know, focus here is, is sharing sort of the broad 
capture, you know, arena. Um, I will say that some of, you know, the information that we're sharing in regard to best practices is a little bit more uh, specific to our processing solutions. And, uh, but our processing solutions are really meant to be a very universal um, application. So we intake any kind of data, uh, photogrammetry, scanning, volumetric video, we intake all of them. And then we output uh, open file types. So FBX, OBJ, et cetera. Um, and our goal is to give you back, you know, assets that are implementation ready or can be polished for final implementation, implementation, depending on, you know, the use case and the fidelity needs and all of that stuff. And, uh, and so we're really uh, just excited to share with you. Um, we've been, we've been in this space, um, as I mentioned, uh, for nearly four years, um, really digging into photogrammetry, scanning volumetric video, creating uh, not only, you know, our own rigs to test on, but ultimately creating this processing solution that can serve for a lot of people. So photogrammetry, scanning, and volumetric video is uh, what we'll get into, and we will start with photogrammetry. You wanna take it away, Tim? Sure. So photogrammetry, obviously everybody in the industry has either played with it, looked at it, or used it uh, previously. Um, but the biggest thing that you need to remember, of course, that it, it is using photos to go ahead and capture spatial data. Uh, using an aggregation of images, I can figure out or assume how far away a camera is from an object. So what's cool about that is I can take these photos that go all the way around and then I fill in the points, the points of how far away the camera believes it is from the asset and then you can end up making a three-dimensional mesh out of it. Of course, this is a very, very glazed overview uh, on what that is. Uh, you can do physical objects and environments. The real world is obviously what you're trying to do. You're digitizing reality using cameras. Um, like we talked about, yes, you are using uh, the photos very specifically to go ahead and measure and interpret uh, electromagnetic imagery uh, and being able to turn that into a three-dimensional asset. So we're, we're, we're using this information, uh, both photos and like you said, electromagnetic imagery uh, to go ahead and measure and interpret things. So we understand using the aggregation of cameras and aggregation of photos, what it looks like in three-dimensional space. Um, and then of course you can view the three-dimensional asset in all different angles. So unlike using a depth sensor, a single depth sensor where it goes one direction or a single camera and you're looking at it in two dimensions or you can look at it in two and a half dimensions if you add some depth information to it. Uh, photogrammetry, the concept is a fully three-dimensional object. So, yeah. What I love thinking about is the origin of photogrammetry, um, which really came from, you know, around, around the 1900s. Um, they started creating maps um, by actually going up in hot air balloons and, and drawing out or sketching out the area around them. Um, and then they would travel a distance, a specific distance, say five miles. Uh, and then they would go up in the balloon again and they would draw the correlating objects that they could see. And then they would actually find those points of interest, that same oak tree that's in the middle of those, you know, two distances. And then they could actually understand topographically what's happening. Um, and so this is obviously, you know, the advanced digitized version of that, um, but it's so fascinating to think of its origins and this being, you know, a, a technology and a technique that has been used for so long. Yeah, it's a, it's a big game of uh, trigonometry. If anybody likes making triangles, that's, yeah. that's, I do that all day long. That's it. Yay, math. <laughs> math. <laughs> Um, so obviously, uh, you know, asset build out, we talked about real world objects. Um, the, the goal here, you know, with photogrammetry is, is still objects. That's really sort of, you know, the prime use and function. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities here, you know, in the asset build out, uh, virtual production, obviously, you know, there are many ways to capture, you know, a person's body, a frame, uh, a, a pose, T pose, and then you're putting those in and creating more opportunity, um, by rigging them by adding mocap, by doing all kinds of other things to add in more of that realistic movement. That's typically the case here. Um, scene build out, you are doing, there are a ton of folks out there using, you know, drone, 
photography. Um, there are a ton of folks out there using, you know, point and click cameras to go and take scenes. Uh, you know, there is a massive amount of uh, interesting ways to use this in regard um, to pre-visualization all the way through to actual, you know, finalization and implementation of environments inside of, you know, major motion pictures, VR, you name it. Um, and then character rigging, of course, I mentioned that a little bit, but facts, you know, your facial animation system, you are looking at, you know, how you actually uh, take that realism from the human face. And this is a very, very, this is the most common way to do this now. Um, you know, you're also, folks are getting into, you know, other techniques as well, but uh, there's a ma massive amount of uh, function here that has been utilized across industries um, for realism. Have anything to add, Tim? Of course. I always <laughs> have things to add. I would definitely say one of the biggest things to remember while you're, you're doing photogrammetry and you're using these use cases is that there are ways to go ahead and delight any of your assets. Uh, so a lot of people get themselves stuck, especially when they're getting new into photogrammetry and then they take an asset directly in. Uh, Unity has a delighter, uh, a lot of other uh, tools can do that based off of a normal map. And the other thing is, if you haven't done a whole bunch of work inside of game engines, there the, a lot of the technology that you're going to be walking into with photogrammetry, uh, especially as you're going into real-time production, really does lend itself towards spending some more time looking at what game video game paradigms are. Um, we actually did a talk earlier on this. Uh, I gave a talk, two talks yesterday, one of them on how to do video game paradigms as far as real-time production and what you would want to go ahead and do and use and, and asset production and pipeline, everything like that. And then I gave another talk in the beginning of the day that was specifically on how to do optimization. Like what do you want to spend your time on and your energy on and where do you want to go ahead and, um, and, and put, uh, put your efforts into while you're doing this, because you're walking at this point in time away from what is traditional, um, waterfall style production, and you're going into more of either an as, uh, agile methodology or into a secular, if you're, you're not familiar with agile, is the idea that I could shoot today and I could do my assets tomorrow, which is just insane. But you can also shoot today, have the assets and have a background version of it that's low quality, and then you can have a higher quality one so it can be showcased. So it also doesn't have to happen where it's entirely separated. If you look at what they did with the Mandalorian where everything, they said more than 50% of the shots were actually done in camera. Now I suspect they of course did things like sweetening it at the end, you know, with some color correct and maybe some grading, blah, blah, blah. But they said what they did was dome, use the dome for lighting, and then they had a background with a green screen, and then they would go ahead and they do the capture, and then the green screen was taken away with advanced machine learning uh, algorithms, and then they were able to go ahead and add back in these assets. So they could do all these changes and everything all on set, um, and that can happen here. It can. It's a play. It's no longer this goes to this, and this goes to this, and then it goes downstream, and then you end up rendering things, and it comes out. How does it come out? Who knows? It can all interplay and you can do all of these things uh, now, tomorrow, yesterday, all at the same time. So um, I think I think that's kind of the biggest thing to remember here and, and the, why, the reason why photogrammetry is such a big thing. You know, you could even have a lot of fun with it and be, you know, the world's biggest super villain and take scans of absolutely every major artifact in the world and have them around you and they would look real because they were. So. Much less mystery. Absolutely. No, no, it's it. I, I, I believe that these people would be full of intrigue and mystery. I, I don't believe we're <laughs> any of that here. Uh, all right. So scanning, uh, you know, again, you know, we're capturing spatial data, physical objects and environments, you know, it's, it's really similar. Um, but there are some other ways to capture it versus just, you know, uh, sort of standard cameras, if you will. Um, so structured light, uh, LIDAR, uh, and lots of other miscellaneous scanners out there. And again, you know, there are a lot of benefits to, you know, this particular type, um, especially in regard to, uh, you know, environments, you know, as we see there, there's a drone, right? Drones can use uh, photogrammetry or they can use scanners. It really just depends on, uh, you know, their, their data capacity, to be honest, how they're, what they're doing with all the data they're capturing. Um, and then, of course, the functionality, right? A photogrammetry, uh, you know, set is going to be very different in functionality than a LiDAR set. Tim? Definitely. I mean, so I think the biggest thing is remember that new quadcopters 
are basically little planes. Um, and so you can get even more on that. I've seen uh, some of our customers are sending through that are LIDAR scans with, uh, with photogrammetry attached all at the same time. Um, but then there is another way of doing it that's just a bunch easier is, is either A, having two drones, or you do LIDAR, you can do plane LIDAR, which is actually not super expensive. Um, you can run flights uh, back and forth. Uh, you find a crop duster guy uh, and you, you put a LIDAR <laughs> on the bottom, like a laser. You just, yeah, that's, that's, that's how you do it. If you go to, uh, you know, want to do a Mayan temple or something like that. And then, and then you can, you know, send a drone through to get these scans. Um, or you could do just LIDAR, sky LIDAR, which is, you know, white and black, uh, and then add on top of that photos from the ground. Um, and then you combine that all together and you get some really amazing things. I, I really think one of the biggest things that you want to remember in this situation is that it's a little bit more interplay. There's a little bit more, um, did we get that area? Because it's not just one scan, it's multiple scans. Although LiDAR on its own really does a really good job as long as you're not concerned with having color uh, that's in there, um, you know, colored point clouds with, you know, RGBD depth uh, using something, you know, like a, uh, a real sense camera or something like that, you know, does combine it all together. And then you end up getting like a bag file or something like that out of it. And then you get some really good stuff. Um, obviously, the quality is limited because, you know, it's, it is a technology that is more consumer grade uh, than professional grade and, and, and things like that. But there's, there's a lot of really good answers here. And there's a lot of even better answers that are coming, especially as we're getting better now with, uh, you know, things like view illusion, um, view synthesis as, as it's, uh, you know, actually termed, uh, and then and then different things like being able to combine uh, LiDAR better with photogrammetry. I mean, it's been around for a long time that we're doing this, but really what it, the, the ability for machine learning algorithms to uh, centroid out the two assets uh, has been gotten, gotten a lot better. Uh, so you don't need a manual back and forth to kind of get it going. So uh, yeah, that's, that's where I would come from on this. Yeah, as, as Tim mentioned, you know, these, these sort of examples are, you know, s the standalone scanning examples and the standalone photogrammetry examples. But the reality is there is a lot, a lot of application and function and uh, just amplification of the technologies when you can combine them. Um, and we'll talk about uh, a couple of those uh, going forward as well. Um, so obviously, you know, we're talking, you know, your asset, asset build out, your scene build out, your character rigging, again, very similar use cases, but ultimately, you know, what you're doing is you're, you're creating even more depth, even more information. Um, you're getting a lot more data to deal with. Um, and Overall, you know, it depends. Do you have the, the money and the equipment to create scans or do you have the money and the equipment to create photogrammetry arrays? Are you focusing on capturing in a studio? Are you focusing on capturing outdoors? Um, so there's a lot of different ways to sort of slice this and dice this and figure out um, the technology that actually serves best to the purpose that you're, you're working toward. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, in e each and every one of these instances, um, you know, like we talked about, there there are good answers. Um, are there great answers yet in this world? N not without a lot of manual intervention, um, which is, you know, where we're trying to work right now to change, you know, machine learning algorithms feeding back into LIDAR to go ahead and increase the amount of points that they're able capable of, um, you know, is really going to help out because, you know, LIDAR with really high precision is actually extremely slow. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to go ahead and fill in those places and provide still a smooth surface uh, that gives sharp edges uh, in adding that with photogrammetry and doing the same exact concept where we're filling in the places between the photos with few synthesis really is going to give something great. Something that we discussed and touched on a little bit um, was using depth data, so RGBD. Um, and, you know, we're talking about things uh, like unstructured light, uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, really light, um, you know, uh, structured light uh, styles, you know, things like uh, stuff from uh, occipital, uh, the structure sensor, which is a structured light uh, algorithm. Uh, and then, of course, you know, unstructured light, uh, which is, uh, you know, stuff like time of flight, which comes back from, you know, micro soft style uh, captures. Uh, and then, of course, real senses, a little column A, a little column B, depends on which generation you play with. So, you know, right now it's it's kind of a, a you know, we're, we're kind of at 
a arms race. Um, and it doesn't appear that anyone's really kind of coming out the victor, nor is anyone providing solutions that replace what should be. Um, and, and, and really, you can get some amazing results out of photogrammetry uh, that, that aren't even possible with a combination of photogrammetry and scan. But it's, do you have the time? you know, kind of thing, like, you know, trying to literally get somebody going up on scaffolding to go ahead and capture, you know, that castle in the middle, that would be quite entertaining, yeah, let alone months worth of work. So um, you, there's always a trade off. So yeah, the other the other minor distinction here is that uh, scanning is more effective. And it does mention this if you read through the slide, it mentions, this, uh, you know, thin and ornate objects, um, intricate wardrobe pieces, those types of things. Um, photogrammetry is all about coverage. If you have a million photos of something, it will be great. If you missed a spot, um, then you're, you know, and that's where a lot of this sort of recreation of data comes in. Um, but ultimately, scanning is a better use case for highly elaborate objects, wardrobe, people, uh, and places um, as well, because there's a lot of intricate detail in, you know, a castle versus a, a skyscraper. So. And last but not least, volumetric video. So the, uh, the, the goal with volumetric video is really to capture a person or object in motion. So the incredibly functional part of volumetric video is capturing human faces. So we have macro and micro expressions. Uh, we have flushing that is incredibly, highly easily for us to detect as humans and trying to recreate that um, via other alternatives um, is really challenging. And so that's, you know, when you get to that point where you're watching that movie and that CG character um, is like grossing you out or freaking you out and kind of weirded out by it, Uncanny Valley, right? That's kind of inevitable. And the massive amount of, you know, VFX and, and humanoid and virtual human, you know, things that are happening in the world, not in just movies anymore, um, you know, across the spectrum of media, um, we're really seeing there's a great opportunity for volumetric video to take that place and really help bring that humanistic side to characters. We also think that it's wonderful to drive facial animation, um, whether you're overlaying with an animated character or whether you're animating it for some other use case. Um, it's wonderful. Uh, and we think that this is really the future of capture. This is where it's all going to angle toward. Um, and what do you have to add, Tim? I have, I have lots of things to add, as is always. <laughs> um, so it, I think the biggest thing, and the reason why Alex is talking about, you know, facial rigs, facial rigs are a lot easier to control um, in both instances. Uh, you know, having a large rig like this, where we're showcasing, you know, this is 120 cameras. Um, you know, there are 26 computers that are involved. Um, you know, the technological need is is extremely high. And, and the reason why we have so many computers on this one had nothing to do with computational capability, has everything to do with getting the data back. So the amount of data that needs to transform, you know, out of that many cameras is so high. You have to think, uh, you know, we, we do uh, for 1920 by 1080 on all of those cameras over 100 gigs per minute. So, you know, if you go up higher, if you talk about 4K, 8K, you know, you could easily burn through. And I've, I've gotten 10 second sequences that were two terabytes from very large camera arrays. It's just, it's insane. Um, and so uh, volumetric video, if you reduce that down to like head, and we talk about we're reducing this down to the idea of adding motion capture and things like that. You can go back to a lot of really good technologies that are out there, uh, you know, until the time that uh, technology does catch up with it. Volumetric video has a lot of really wonderful use cases as well. Um, if you are trying to get gross movements, background movements, if you have the space, the processing, the time, we've proved that you can save a whole bunch of money by doing it in volumetric video. Um, the biggest thing is it's that price to entry. So, you know, as some of the discussions that we had prior to actually starting this speech, um, you know, doing 360 is a higher quality, but the cost is exponential in doing volumetric. It's the same. Photogrammetry can be a small, you know, uh, DSLR rig, um, while volumetric video is a very large 
DSLR rig that needs to have massive amount of precision that's on it. Or you can use in this specific case, things like webcams or anything else uh, in between that. So um, I love the technology. I think it's great. And I definitely think that it is the future of video. It is fully three dimensional. Um, and technology right now is moving in leaps and bounds to meet the demand that is requested of what volumetric video can provide because two dimensional video provides so little information Let's really be honest about that. And, and, you know, if we kick off to the next slide, uh, you can definitely see that, it, you know, it's not just about actors and cameras and things like that. Um, it provides the ability for the world to be you and you to be in the world and everything to match all together. Um, and, and so I, I really believe that as we continue feeding this technology, as you look at the character over on the left, he's as real as real gets. And that will continue to happen and, and we will continue to make those things. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, so our, our technology itself um, on the volumetric video side uh, does not require a green screen. Um, and the goal there is again to just drop that bar. You don't have to have an entire green screen studio available to you to create volumetric video. You don't. Um, and, you know, we, we have tested everything from, you know, your webcam rigs all the way up through very high end uh, rigs with DSLRs and you name it. Um, we've done all kinds of processing for a wide variety of clients from their rigs. And we don't often know even what the rig is um, in and of itself, how many cameras it has necessarily. Well, we have, we get, there's some data, right, that, that gives us the, uh, some of the basic information, but the reality here is that, you know, if you have capture capability, then there's no reason that you can't have the ability to extend it to volumetric video if you're not already doing it. Um, it's great for digital doubles, um, facial animation, of course. And as, uh, as we mentioned earlier with the, you know, the combination of technologies um, and, and what Tim was talking about uh, just previously was that combination of, you know, the facial rig. Um, so you can actually capture a bust and a face and get that realism from the human. And then you combine that with photogrammetry. You do a uh, photogrammetric capture of the body. Um, in an A pose or a T pose, then you can rig that, then you can actually create, you know, a mocap um, process with that. I mean, there are a million things that you can do with that. And not only does that minimize your physical footprint for the rig, you know, space that you need, but also minimizes your digital footprint because the asset can be significantly smaller because as I mentioned, volumetric video is a hog. <laughs> it just is. Um, and so there's a lot of functionality within the shoot itself where you can, um, there's opportunities as well. So drone matching without GPS, we've actually done that with a couple of clients, uh, match moving, uh, you know, crane shots, um, group and remote location shots, stunt shots, all of these things can be improved uh, safety wise, time wise, and ultimately it gives back a lot of that creative freedom that the director has because you have a full 3D ob you know, person or object that you can manipulate the scene around um, or you can manipulate them in the scene, like vice versa. And it's gonna minimize or, or really just get rid of reshoots um, massively. So there's a lot of wonderful ways to execute volumetric video um, into, you know, content creation for movies, for, for games, for uh, you name it, really anything. Um, so. Definitely. Anyway. I think one of the things, so, you know, to give you an example, uh, um, one movie that I worked on uh, specifically had a main actor uh, and that main actor, we did a full digital double on, uh, and the full digital double was originally slated for a minute and a half and had a whole bunch of different things that they wanted to do with it. So it was a full digital double, hands, fingers, face, full facts, like you name it all the way across the board, you know, and an asset like that costs multiple millions of dollars, not just capture process, putting it together. Um, and then it was pushed down to about 15 seconds and it was something that was literally just because it was a dangerous capture and they wanted to go ahead and do a, a switch out between the main actor and the stunt double. They end up just using the body pose because they're like, oh, we have this digital double and we have to do something with it. And so then they end up putting it in. When if you had just done it in volumetric video, you really could have gone ahead and gotten it through in under 
you know, $30,000 uh, versus multiple millions of dollars. It, it just shows that there is a, a new style of technology and, and, and that really, that there are really good use cases for it. So. So uh, we have another talk this afternoon about best practices for capture. Uh, we'll get a little bit more in depth about you know some of the some of the strengths and the weaknesses um, of of capture um, in this style. And we also have a capture guide that's available on our website. Um, you can scroll to the bottom of our homepage and uh, plug it in, and it will give you the PDF right there. And we actually have an Intel article that we published. Um, probably two years ago now, yep. um, which is a very technical look at, you know, the broad sort of uh, array of capture technologies. Um, and it's, it's specific to uh, volumetric video and, and photogrammetry, a little bit less scanning, but still very applicable. Um, these things have not changed massively <laughs> in the last bit. Um, they've just been added to. So uh, you're also welcome to reach out to us. We love talking to people about these, you know, awesome cool technologies and really enabling others to do to do more so and that really that's us uh, we also have a um, a, co a code that you can use for uh, $500 in free processing credits um, sig 20 and you can do that after you register through our website and you're welcome to reach out to me alex at montechlabs.com or tim tim at montechlabs.com awesome well thank you all very much uh, and i definitely look forward to hearing and seeing more from each and every one of you. Very cool.